welcome. Joining me today, Professor Steve Hankey. Hankey is a professor of applied economics at the Johns Hopkins University. He served on President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors and is one of the world's premier authorities on hyperinflation. Hankey is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., a senior fellow at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, and a contributing editor at Central Banking in London. In 1998, he played an important role in establishing new currency regimes in Argentina, Estonia, and Bulgaria, among other countries. Hankey's most recent books are Currency Board, Volume 1, Theory and Policy, 2020, Currency Ports, Volume 2, Studies and Selected European Countries, 2020, Currency Port for Developing Countries, a Handbook in 2021, and Public Debt Sustainability International Perspective in 2022. Welcome to the show, Steve, and thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Osama. So let's kick off this conversation with the $1 million question. Official inflation in Egypt is 21.27%. However, Hanke's annual inflation in Egypt is 101%. So how do you explain this massive gap between your calculation and the official one? Well, in countries that have elevated inflation rates, that's inflation rates above about 25%. The only way to accurately measure inflation in those dynamic high inflation situations is to use what's called purchasing power parity. And that's what I've developed and, and used uh, to measure these high inflations. And, and what happens, the, the chain of reasoning is fairly simple. You, you look at the change in the exchange rate and the, translate that into what is an implied inflation rate? And as you say, in Egypt, it's right now 101%. It's about five times higher than the official rate. And from my Egyptian friends that I speak with on a regular basis, they, they tell me that on the street, 101 is pretty close. And, uh, and I, can, I can say we, we've done a lot of scholarly work on this. And in these high inflation environments, purchasing power parity, as I use it, is very, very accurate. And how the government calculates its, its inflation rate? Well, the, the government has a, a they, they do it in a standard way, like most governments. They have a, a basket of, of goods uh, and services that they, they put in the basket and they they go out and, and sample and get measurements of these price changes of all the items in the basket every month, and, and then they come up with a, a monthly inflation number, and that's where you get inflation at 21.27% in Egypt. The, problem, the, the problems are enormous because, number one, they often don't have the right, they don't have everything in the basket. My, my basket has everything in it. Hmm. Everything being transacted in Egypt is in my basket. The official basket is a little tiny basket without very many items in it. So that's one problem. Then you have all kinds of problems in, in high inflations. What if you go out uh, the first day of the month to get the calculation, but the index, the basket, comes out at the end of the month. Well, in a month, a lot of inflation can occur. So you're always be kind of behind the curve, shall we say. And then uh, in a place like Egypt, where you have a lot of corruption, you, you know they manipulate the data. So the, da the data are basically manipulated. So, so those, are, those are the three problems. The, hmm. the basket isn't totally inclusive. And in high inflation situations, that can be very important. The second thing is that there are all kinds of sampling and data errors, technical errors that you get into. And three, in a place like Egypt, as I say, you've got a lot of corruption and un unreliability in the civil service and government. So you know they're doctoring the data, or you they might be. We don't, and, we and don't do know. Do you think, Steve, yeah, and do you think that the... the the government basket is tiny. This is intentionally by the government? 
It often is. I, I have no proof in Egypt that it is. I can say historically, studying various developing countries like Egypt, mm. where you have endemic corruption, you you have big problems with data manipulation. They they we have a big long historical record of countries manipulating the data. Mm. I would not be surprised if Egypt is manipulating the data. And I'm talking about the government and the regime. In his latest public speech, Egyptian President Sisi said that there is a global economic crisis that Egypt is not responsible for, and the prices are soaring everywhere in the world. So do you agree with the president of Egypt? Do you think the world is facing a global inflation? No. Inflations are always local. President Sisi is just trying to distract from, from the real problem, which is a local problem. And the, the local problem is the fact that you have a, a, a current, in, in particular, a currency that, that's really kind of junk. If you look at uh, the pound since January 2022, a little, little over a year ago, it's, it's depreciated by about 47% against the U.S. dollar. Yeah. Now, they, had, they, they came in with a new program, supposedly, that was blessed by the IMF. In October 27, 2022, they have what they call a durable but flexible exchange rate, which, which is a contradiction in terms, by the way, durable, <laughs> flexible exchange rate. It, it's a kind of a nonsense thing. But what's happened? The pound's depreciated since October 27, 2022, by 22% against the U.S. dollar. So as the pound goes down, inflation is imported. And why is it imported? Because of a local problem, not a, not a global problem. The pound is a local currency. It's the Egyptian money. Hmm. It isn't a global currency. In fact, no one outside of Egypt uses a pound because it's junk. It's, it's worthless, basically. For, for international transactions, it, it, it's, it's, it's just not used. Yeah, I, so, I think th th this is a very important point, um, Steve. However, the regime in Egypt, they, they always blame the pandemic, firstly. Secondly, the Russia's war in Ukraine. So do you think these are the only reasons for high inflation and economic crisis in Egypt? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, China has faced the same thing, and they have an inflation rate less than 2% a year. Switzerland has the same problem uh, as everybody else, and they have a, a very low inflation. Japan has the same problem as everybody else. They have the same problems that, that they have in Egypt and Japan, and they have a very low inflation. So who, who should hold that the, the, the reason they have low inflations in China... Japan and Switzerland is because they control the money supply. And why Egypt can't control the money supply? That, well, that, that's, that's, that's an, actually an easy one to, to answer in a way. They spend a lot of money and, and the central bank buys a lot of bonds issued by the government to finance the government spending. And when they buy those bonds from the government, they have to print money. Hmm. And, and, and they print too much money. That, that's the big problem. They, they, have, they, they are not watching the money supply. Okay, and um, the, the, the government in Egypt always, as Steve has, some solutions and uh, um, some unusual solutions to offer to the people. So, for example, to combat food inflation, the National Nutrition Institute in Egypt has suggested that Egyptians eat chicken feet and claimed chicken feet are good for the body and for the budget as well. How do you see that? Well, it, 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 it's kind of a bad joke, actually. Uh, I, I, I feel sorry for the Egyptians, and there are a lot of Egyptians in poverty right now because of the inflation tax. Because, by the way, inflation is a tax, a huge tax. 
that no one voted on. It's, it's imposing a tax, particularly on poor people, because poor people ha have to spend all their income just to survive. And every time they spend income, what? They're hit with inflation. And that's the inflation tax. So it, it hits the poor people much harder than the rich people, because if you're rich, what do you do? Well, you don't spend 100% of your income, so you're not being hit with that tax over 100% of the income that you're spending. What do you do? You save, you invest maybe in the stock market, and the, and the stock prices are going up. Or maybe you buy a bigger house, and the house price goes up. So you, you have a hedge against inflation. Poor people don't. They have to spend all their money. They, they don't save anything. And when they save, when they spend 100% of their money, all of the 100% that they're spending is taxed by the inflation. Yeah, and um, this month on January 11th, which was one of the most dramatic days in Egyptian economic history, you tweeted and I uh, quote, Egypt will soon learn an age-old lesson. Contrary to IMF speak, countries can devalue their way to prosperity. How do you explain that? Well, th this, the, the IMF, by the way, they, since 1962, there have been many IMF programs in Egypt. Every decade, Egypt has been involved in an IMF program. And, and none of these programs have worked. And the new program will not work, by the way. It is not working. Starting in October, when they did the durable, flexible exchange rate, what did I tell you? The pound collapsed. It went down 22% against the U.S. dollar. So the IMF programs do not work. We've done an extensive study of the IMF programs. And actually, countries with IMF programs fare worse than countries that are similar but have no IMF programs. And this devaluing your way to prosperity, the IMF li likes to go with these flexible exchange rates, devalue the currency. They say that's going to lead to prosperity. But think of it. If, if that was true, we would have one of the greatest economies in the world in Venezuela, where, where over the last few years, they've completely decimated the Venezuelan Bolivar. It's, it's depreciated by over 99% against the U.S. dollar. Or go to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is in Africa, and it's devalued its currency again over the last year by over 90%. So and 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 they they don't have prosperity. Look at the alternative, the one currency that's actually appreciated in real inflation-adjusted terms since World War One, the only one in the world that's actually appreciated in real terms over time, the Swiss franc, and and the Swiss economy does beautifully. They have a tremendous export sector, very stable economy. And, and a very strong currency. The, the strongest currency in the world over time is the Swiss franc. Hmm. And do you think when the, the IMF published the recent agreements between it and Egypt, they stated um, some agreements. One of, uh, of it was reducing the state footprint, including military-owned companies. And some economists published some analysis saying that this is a golden opportunity for the Egyptian economy to withdraw the military grip over the economy. Do you agree with that? Well, it, yes. Uh, it, it, the military has to, and government has too much of a grip on the Egyptian economy. But the problem is that the IMF has no way to enforce these conditions. That's why all the IMF programs fail. Because the IMF is not in control of things in Egypt. The government's in control. And, and the government, in my judgment, probably won't do very much. And, and um, among other things, they're going to do some stupidities, like uh, uh, this, this huge mega project of a new capital. That, that will be a white elephant of the highest order 
the waste, fraud, and abuse associated with that will be enormous. The corruption will be tremendous. I think it's a completely unwise thing to do, a big distraction. In other words, it's a big distraction for the real problems. What the government is doing, they're saying, we're going to build a new city, but you Egyptians eat chicken feet in the meantime. Hmm. And, and, by the way, if you look at, for example, the Cato Institute, which you mentioned I'm associated with, they, they, they evaluate 165 countries every year on human freedom and economic freedom. And where does Egypt stand? On human freedom, they're 161 out of 165 countries. Economic freedom, 149 out of 165 countries. Rule of law, 144 out of 165. Safety and security, 137 out of 165. The government can't even keep Egypt safe for people to be walking around in the street. Uh, also, the legal system and property rights, 143 out of 165. Terrible rankings and all those structural things. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are all structural institutional things that, that don't get changed very fast. And the, and the rating of Egypt, they're, they're at the bottom of the barrel. But, the but you, know, you know, Steve, the, the, the governments always do, do like to argue such a ranking and such an indicator. So the question is, from the government perspective, how these all bad rankings and uh, uh, indicators impact the economy? Well, I've done a number of studies on this. And if economic free, the economic freedom scores... The, the better your score, the higher the potential and the actual growth rate in the economy. So it's, it's, it's very closely related, almost one to one. You, you in, increase your economic freedom ranking by 10 percent and you, you get a 10 percent jump in the potential and actual GDP in the country. And, and, and so if you want to be prosperous, you, you have to have a lot of economic freedom. Yeah. And, and, and let's, let's look at the one that ranks up at the top, Singapore. Singapore has a very high, either one or two, I can't remember the rank right now. But they became independent in 1965. Lee Kuan Yew was, became the president. He, he introduced all kinds of free market, sound money, security, safety, rule of law, private property, all those things got much better. And Singapore, from 1965 until today, they, they were one of the poorest countries in the world when they became independent in 1965. Now, now they're one of the richest. Hmm. And you just said that uh, IMF can't force the Egyptian regime to withdraw the military if, uh, grip from the uh, economy. However, they can hold uh, the installments of this uh, uh, recent loan. They, they just uh, released uh, uh, 300 million and 47 to, uh, as a first install, uh, uh, installment. So do the IMF, does the IMF can hold these other installments until the regime follow the agreement? They, they could, but they typically don't. And, and uh, the, the, as I say, the whole withholding of installments doesn't really have much teeth. If you look at the history of the IMF, most of the countries that are involved with the IMF are involved on a regular basis, that, like, like Egypt. As I said, they started in 1962 with IMF programs. Every decade since 1960, the 1960s, Egypt has had an IMF program, and all of them have failed. If, if they would have worked, there would be no need for the IMF. The, hmm. the pound would be strong. There'd be no inflation. Poverty levels would be a lot lower. The, the government wouldn't be suggesting ridiculous things like eating chicken feet to control inflation. Now, all, all of that would have, be, that would have been fixed a long time ago. If the IMF program worked, the problem is they don't work. Yeah. 
And in your recent article, the IMF and Sri Lanka are partners in delusion. You wrote, and I quote, back in April 2022, Sri Lanka's currency collapsed, having depreciated by 44% against the US dollar. According to our measure, inflation reached a stunning 74.5% per year. Sri Lanka even suspended payment on its external debt. Then the IMF fire uh, Prigate arrived. So is Egypt on the same track? Um, do you think Egypt could face Sri Lanka's fate? Yes. The, 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 one, the one difference is, uh, uh, and, and, and this is fairly important, given the geographic location of Egypt, they, they have always uh, been the beneficiary of a lot of military and, and foreign aid hmm. for, for strategic reasons. And, and that, that's part of the problem with Egypt, by the way. They've been living off handouts. They pass the begging bowl and they get money because they're in alliances with other partners and those partners think for some reason they need Egypt. For, for, geo, for geostrategic reasons. But what happens, the money goes to Egypt, and where does what pockets does it go into? You know what pockets it goes into. It goes into the political pockets and, and government pockets, one way or another, and, and does nothing more than fuel corruption and ultimately destroys Egypt. I mean, I, I would argue the foreign aid has been one of the, one of the most, uh, shall we say, destructive hmm. economic aspects of Egypt because the foreign aid goes in and it, it's just fuel for cor corruption. It just pours fuel on the corruption fire. And that's why you get all these terrible ratings in Egypt for things like corruption. It's very corrupt. And do you think there is a danger of bankruptcy in Egypt soon, Steve? I, uh, well, yes. Why? They, 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 they are on the Bloomberg list for potential default, by the way. Hmm. I think they're ranked, num they're, they're number five on the Bloomberg list of, of possible uh, defaults. So the answer to that is yeah, yes, I, I agree with Bloomberg. But the, the government in Egypt is keep denying this and saying, look, to 2022, we paid all our... Uh, um, debts in, in this year, and we will keep paying by borrowing uh, another external debts in 2023. But this is an economic circle, and this is our solution. Well, the, the markets don't believe them because the debt's trading at a huge discount. And as I say, if you look at the Bloomberg list of the countries that are uh, potentially in danger of defaulting, Egypt is on the list. I think it's ranked number five. Hmm. Okay. So, so basically, yeah. the, the government in Egypt doesn't really have any credibility. That, that's the, the, the bottom line is they can say whatever they want to, but no one really believes them. And, and why don't they believe them? Because they, they lie all the time. If, if they were telling the truth, People would believe them. If you, if you were telling me every time I talked to you, uh, Osama, something that was accurate, yeah. I, I would think, well, the next time Osama tells me something, it's going to be accurate. Hmm. But if you told me something that was wrong every single time and turned out to be a lie, I, I, I would think, oh, he, he can't be trusted. I'm not, I'm not going to believe what he tells me. And that's the problem with Egypt. And do you think markets now don't trust the government. No. Hmm. All, all you have to all you have to do. Uh, th this is not my subjective evaluation. This is an objective fact. If you look at the markets and the market price for Egyptian debt, that's that's objectively what the market's telling you. Hmm. But you know, Steve, um, the the government just introduced the IMF the, the the recent loan with the IMF as the last chance, the last economic chance. And with this loan, we will uh, obtain the trust of the market globally and uh, the external investors will um, come again to Egypt and we will have the hot money again in Egypt because there is two, uh, 20 billion 
uh, withdraw from the market in Egypt last year? What do you think? Well, I, I, I don't. That, that's not a fact. That's not based on any facts. That's wishful thinking. Hmm. Because if that was true, that's what the government's been saying, uh, various governments, not, not just this government. This is nothing new in Egypt. I, I said they've been on IMF life support since 1962. This has been going. This is this has been going on for uh, you know 60 year over 60 years. In, in fact, precisely 60 years. If you subtract the numbers, you get 60. Yeah. So it's 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 nothing new. It's it's an old Egyptian way way of doing business in the government. No matter what the government is, every single government has done the same thing. Okay, on January 19th, you tweeted, and I uh, quote, Egypt plans to build a multi-billion dollar new capital city 40 miles east of Cairo. Meanwhile, Egypt will be required to pay over 100 billion in domestic and foreign debt in the coming years. Amazing. Not a good time to be building a white elephant. But to be honest, Steve, this is a huge um, debate in Egypt because the presidents um, keep praising himself as the man who launching a new republic in Egypt with 24 smart cities um, like the, the, the new capital. And many reports and economists um, said no with the 60% of Egyptian people at or under the poverty rate. This is not an economic priority. So what are your thoughts on building a new city, spending all these billions on 24 smart cities in Egypt? Well, I think it's a terrible idea. I, what, what, one, one area in which I have a specialization is infrastructure economics. And I, and I can tell you, all these mega projects turn out to be economic disasters. That's the typically, not, not all, but typically. If, if you look, you're, you're in London right now, and if you look at the channel going over to the continent, the, the annual rate of return on that white elephant, it's negative. It's a negative rate of return. In other words, they invested a lot of money to build the channel, and, and the return is, is negative. The costs are actually greater than the benefits. And, and that's typical of, of all these mega projects that you have. Or, or sometimes they call them vanity projects, where some somebody like President Sisi, he wants a vanity project, a, a new city, you know, with his name plastered all over the thing. Hmm. But, you know, so President Sisi... They're, 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 a bad, they're a bad idea. Yeah. In, in, in Egypt... The benefits will be less than the, less than the cost, so it will be uneconomic. And on top of it, it will fuel a tremendous amount of corruption. And regarding these benefits from the new capital of these mega projects, infrastructure projects in Egypt, the government say this project will offer jobs for maybe five millions uh, in Egypt, attract investors, and offer a foreign currency. In, in the central bank. Do you agree with that? No. Why? I just look at the history of these projects. They, they don't, that's not how they work. That's how they're advertised. But the advertising is always false. The, the, the jobs don't come and the jobs cost more, more than they're worth. In other words, the, the, the whole thing is kind of a sham, basically. It's a fake. That, that's that's the history of mega projects. If if you look at the scholarly literature on mega projects, they're always the same. Hmm. They cost way more than projected. The benefits are way less. And and the and when do they arrive? They they don't arrive on time. They arrive way after the the deadline that's been set for the finalization of their construction. So do you believe a $59 billion new capital city in Egypt is a fake? Yes. Wow. I, it's, it's not gonna happen. I mean, you, <laughs> I, 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 I'm basing my judgment on hmm. ex post evaluations of, that have been done on, on actual real mega projects that have been built.
and and what those show is that they end up costing way more and producing way fewer benefits than advertised before they start the project. Hmm. So so they say they say a lot of things before the project starts. I mean, look at the channel going from the UK over to France. That that was going to be the best thing since sliced bread. Well, it's turned out it's a white elephant. Yeah. Benefits way, way, way less than the cost. Rate of return negative, about 15% a year. They're, they're not getting a positive interest and in payback of 15%. They're getting a negative drain of 15%. And what are your thoughts on the, the selling assets now? The, the government, uh, the, the announced that they will start selling assets, the IMF agreements, stated that there is two billion dollars uh, will come through um, Egyptian government selling assets to other uh, uh, countries or investors. It, it, this is a solution for the economic crisis in Egypt? In, in principle, I, I, don't, I don't know the details of the point number one. I don't know the details of the program. But remember, when I was on President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors, I was in charge of privatization. That, that is selling, selling government assets to the public. I was the one who designed that program for President Reagan. And in fact, I, I was the one who got the word privatization in the, in the Webster's Dictionary in the English language at that time. So I, I, I do know something about it, and it's a very good idea because most of these governments have... Uh, tremendous amount, especially in Egypt and especially the military, all kinds of assets that they should be selling to the private sector. They should be selling to the private sector. The assets would be utilized much more uh, efficiently and effectively. And, and the government, of course, would receive revenues. And if they're selling these to other countries, to um, Gulf countries, for example, is it the same benefits, the same positive impact? I, I don't really have a judgment on that. Okay. If, if they're selling from one government to the next, that's not really privatization. Yeah. So... So, so it, it, if, they're, if they're selling to a private entity, that is privatization. I am an advocate of privatization. I've written a number of books on it. And as I say, I, I was the one who designed all of President Reagan's privatization program. So it's, it's a topic I know a lot about. Yeah, because you know there is um, many sovereign funds in Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and Qatar. They started uh, buying some assets in Egypt in the uh, last two months? Well, again, uh, I, I don't want to make any judgment without seeing yeah. exactly who's buying, how they will operate, and so forth. All I can do is tell you, in principle, in principle, if, mm. if the government sells an asset to a private entity, that is privatization, and that is good. Because not only will the government receive revenue from the sale of that asset, but those assets will be used more productively in the private sector. There's, there's, a, there's a bureaucratic rule of two. And the bureaucratic rule of two says if something is in the private sector and, and has a cost of one, if you would transfer it into the public sector, just the reverse of privatization, hmm. you would know what the cost would be, it would be two, not one. So the cost of doing things in the government is, is roughly twice as high as in the private sector. So if you're transferring things from the public sector to the private sector, you're probably reducing the cost by about 50%. Yeah, and in, in, in case of Egypt, the private sector is struggling with the military grip over the economy. It's a, um, something like a closed circle, uh, Steve. The military grip, there is no competition with the private uh, uh, sector. So do you think the private sector 
can stand for this uh, buying assets and do the, the, the strategy you just explained or well, with the military uh, well, that, that, that's, a, that's an important point, Osama, and that is that the rules and regulations have to be such that uh, monopolies are discouraged and competition is encouraged. That if you privatize something and put it into the private sector, you want to put it into a, a, a competitive environment. And if you don't, then, then then you have a problem because what you do, you go from a government monopoly to a private monopoly. And and although that's probably better than leaving it in the government hands, it's not as good as it should be. It should be going from the government to the private sector in a competitive environment. And 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 by the way, there there are entrepreneurs, Egyptian entrepreneurs, uh, operating internationally as well as in Egypt, uh, that 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 are good, yeah, and and have good good international reputations. So, I I would uh, hopefully like to see those assets in in the hands of Egyptian entrepreneurs. You have some of them. You you, you know the list. Some some of them actually are friends of mine. Hmm. Okay, yeah. And uh, Steve, the Financial Times editorial board uh, um, wrote, and I quote, it's often assumed that Egypt is too important to fail and that the donors or Gulf states will always bail Cairo. However, the next day of this article, Saudi Arabia's finance, uh, finance minister said at the World Economic Forum in Davis that the kingdom is changing the way it provides assistance to allies, shifting from previously giving direct grants and deposits unconditionally, adding Saudi Arabia was encouraging countries in the region to make reforms. So do you think will Saudi Arabia and other Gulf allies to the regime in Egypt abandon the regime or keep assisting, but by another way? I th well, I th number one, I, I think the first article on Financial Times put their finger on it, and that is, Egypt is seen is seen as important geopolitically, and that's why they receive aid all the time from everybody, yeah. and that's why they have so much aid money going into corruption, and that's why that's why it's 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 actually ruined Egypt. <laughs> the foreign aid has ruined Egypt. So the second article dealing with the Saudis. Maybe, maybe they will change the conditions on which they're providing funding for Egypt. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. His if history is a guide, it won't change very much. Okay, and my but final question. But, but you never know. Yeah. They, 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 they might be true to their word, and, and, and in fact, they, they might actually put conditions on Egypt that have some teeth in them and force Egypt to make some changes. And, and this could help the economy in Egypt? Yes. Of course, it, it would depend on what the changes were, but if, the, if, they, were, if they were advocating things like privatizing and, and getting the military out of all these commercial activities, hmm. that, then, then I would say yes, that would be very good. And if the IMF don't have the power to force Egyptian regime to withdraw the military, uh, do the Gulf countries have the same power? Oh, I think they have more power than the IMF. The IMF doesn't have any power. Hmm. We, we, we've had 60 years of the IMF roaming around in Egypt, and they haven't done anything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. It is, yeah. yes. And um, my final question, Steve. Um, how do you see the future of Egyptian economy in 2023? Uh, negative. If you look at the consensus uh, growth rate in, uh, for Egypt, it, it was uh, about 5.2%. Now the consensus has dropped down to 3.8. So the consensus is going down. And, and the consensus on inflation is going up. So if you look at the recent consensus, now that, that isn't me. That, that's a consensus of lots of economists and financial people. 
they they are saying that the economy is 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 going to get weaker, and they say inflation is going to be higher. So so it's negative. The, the the, the dynamics are negative, not not positive. Professor, and I and I, yeah. and I agree. I, I I agree with the the direction being pointed to by the consensus is the the growth is going to be weaker and the inflation is going to be stronger. And 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 I agree with that. Professor Steve uh, Hanke, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you.